The Bohemian Club. The, as you say, the Bohemian Club? That's where all those rich Republicans go up and stand naked against redwood trees, right? I've never been to the Bohemian Club, but you ought to go. It'd be good for you. Get some fresh air. Ladies and gentlemen, the very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. We decided long ago that the dangers of excessive and unwarranted concealment of pertinent facts far outweighed the dangers which are cited to justify it. Even today, there is little value in opposing the threat of a closed society by imitating its arbitrary restrictions. Even today, there is little value in ensuring the survival of our nation if our traditions do not survive with it. And there is very grave danger that an announced need for increased security will be seized upon by those anxious to expand its meaning to the very limits of official censorship and concealment. Drowning in my misery, up to my neck with memories. I don't feel like remembering, I feel like I'm not growing at all. Honestly, I kind of miss the neglect, because nowadays everybody... Welcome, welcome everyone to the Best Damn Podcast. I am your host, John Keen. As always, I would like to thank you guys for joining me. I ask that you please add, follow, and check us out, www.thebestdampodcast.tv. Follow me, Instagram, Facebook, Best Damn Podcast, Twitter, The Real Best Damn, and wherever you're watching from, make sure to hit the like, give us a thumbs up. Leave a comment, let me know what you think, and share this link. Help us to get it out there, that way new people can find us. Uh, make sure to subscribe, click all on the notifications bell, check out our tarot videos, our astrology videos, and this is part two. This is part two of a series, Occulted, where we're going to be looking at some of the more mystical side of spirituality, and we're going to be looking at the magic of the elites. I think... Um, one of the things that really excites me about this series the most is this not only gives us an opportunity uh, to come together and to learn, you know, as we study these different schools of thought, but it gives us an opportunity as well to see exactly the techniques that the people that are, you know, calling all the shots, the unelected elite class of uh, uh, of people that are kind of ruling over the masses. These are the things that they believe. These are the methods and the techniques that they use to have control over their reality and to kind of engineer yours. So when we have a deeper understanding of this, not only does it allow us to empower ourselves, right? We become better at uh, our own craft. We become better management um, of our thoughts, our emotions, and our energy, you know, and it really gives us an opportunity to expand and grow consciously. And I feel like that's really what's taking place right now. Uh, humanity is at this kind of, it's at, it's at a breaking point, really. Society and the old world, the old way of seeing things, of doing things, the old monetary systems, governmental systems, all of that is like on the brink of collapse, right? We even here in the World Economic Forum, uh, them mentioning now that we are a fractured society. Like, and as part of this Great Reset, which is a cyclical event, right? These processions of the equinox, all of these changes in times and aeons that have taken place for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Um, it's all tracked out through the stars. And people that are practicing the sacred sciences are aware of how the energies interact with human consciousness and our world on a physical, mental, and spiritual level. Right, and they're they're taking this information and they're getting us to create a reality 
or a future that we probably don't want to be a part of, right? But one that would enslave us in a multitude of ways. And we call these people the elites, right? They're the ones who pull the strings. They control the uh, financial system and the economy. When you see what's happening right now, you're all being choked out starved to death through inflation and interest rate hikes and, and all of these things, right? But they know what time to do it because of the astrology that they use. Uh, they use numerical codes um, such as numerology, which we're going to be getting into all of this today. Today we're going to be looking at alchemy, numerology, uh, Pythagorean numerology, uh, the days, the hours, the virtues of the planets. Um, this is going to be a deep dive. We're going to be looking even to the evocation of demons and how to use how they use demons and use them to do their bidding or do their work. So, uh, without any further ado, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, if you guys, please hit the thumbs up if you're in the chat. You can donate support or book a personal tarot reading uh, with the links in the description box below. Or you can join the Vestian fam. So, we'll start here. The Alchemy of Time and Consciousness. And like I said, thank you to everyone for joining me in the chat. Uh, James Dunn, Ralph Russell, Graceful Heart, um, Truth Behind the Lie. Thank you guys. I appreciate you. Those of us who quest for, and make sure you check out part one. That was really crazy. Um, those of us who quest for truth through the alchemy of time and consciousness are the modern day alchemists. They seek truth and ancient wisdom brought forth in today's reality through the language of symbols to come manifest into conscious thought. We are going through the alchemy of time and consciousness as we return to our natural state of light. We are currently going through a merge on many levels of body, mind, and soul. This is linked to the ancient teachings of alchemy as a transformation from one reality to another where one finds eternal life. The alchemist is the wizard he who helps us transform. And when we look at the Bible, Christ even talks about when we see him, we will be like him. We will, we will be transfigured, right? A transfiguration taking place, a metamorphosis from the caterpillar to the butterfly. You see this symbolism all throughout spirituality. It's part of the transformational process of initiation, right? You're initiating the process, if you will, and it's a process of change. You're changed at every level. Um, through, and, and it's understood at a metaphysical level. It's the consciousness, the thought, the mental. It's the emotional side of you. As well as there's physical transformation. It all happens through the spirit. And this is uh, what the Rosicrucians uh, would, would call... Um, Alchemy would be the conversion of, from iron into gold. And remember, iron is a mineral of Saturn right? The God of this world and the Saturnian rule uh, over man. And remember the number of Saturn, six, right? The, the magic cube, 666. This is where we get Satan and 666. Um, and the number of man being 666 as well, right? So transforming the, the physical from iron into gold, right? Or we see the iron mixed with miry clay, right? We were created out of clay from Prometheus, right? And given the divine spark, you see these same kind of things um, repeat over and over and over. Now, part of this alchemical, and this is transfiguration, transmutation, okay? Um, this is alchemy, the philosopher's stone, which is, you know, the third eye, the mind's eye. Part of this alchemical experience links with seeing double digits, such as 1111, which trigger this DNA change in our DNA cellular codings. 11 is a double helix, activation of DNA, and evolution of consciousness. And we're going to look at numerology, and uh, I'll save it for when we get to that. But we're going to look at the number meanings, and we're going to look at Chaldean numerology. And I'm going to show you how to calculate your own personal year for numerology as well. So it's going to be pretty cool. Um, one thing about this series, you're going to actually learn as we go through. If you haven't, in part one, we were I taught you how to do sigils and things like that. Uh, so you will be able to use these skills as well. You'll understand how it's being used against you because you'll have the understanding of it, but you'll also be able to use it in a positive way in your life. Now, one in numerology is all about beginnings. It's opening, activation, 1111, um, the two pillars, right? Balance. Um, 
Ancient alchemists searched for the Philosopher's Stone and the Water of Life. The Philosopher's Stone, originally the stone, was believed to be the chemical that changed base metals into silver or gold. Okay? Often it was termed the power of projection. We are projected illusion in a virtual reality program, and whether or not that's true or not, according to the simulation hypothesis, we live in a simulated reality. And one could really say that that's pro it's very probable, um, one of the more probable scenarios, but either way, we know that we were made in the image of Elohim, right? Elohim, the, the fireless or smokeless fire, the seraphic beings. Um, and the image is a phantom or a projection. So it is an illusion. It's a, a mirror image of something. Now, alchemists sought the knowledge of creation through the sciences of chemistry and metallurgy. These alchemists sought the ancient wisdom of the mystery school teachings handed down originally from Isis and Thoth. Mystery school's knowledge of creation by sacred geometry, a code through which all is created. That's golden ratio, the Fibonacci sequence, right? Alchemists were often magicians, magi, or magnetics. Through the use of metals, the alchemists hoped would duplicate that which was the rods used by the gods and goddesses who can manipulate the program. It's all part of the experiment of our reality. Gold is a metaphor for the alchemy of consciousness through time. It's linked with blood, bloodlines, creation, and the flow of the continuum or collective unconsciousness. The Sumerian creational story is about gods who came to earth in search of gold to sustain their life. Gods who would return every 3,600 years. These are all metaphors for creational geometry as they follow the same encoded blueprint. 3,600 years is a cycle, right? It's one of the bigger cycles that we have here on earth. Well, we have uh, 6,500, 12,500, 25,000, and 3,600 year cycles, right? These are cycles, epochs, aeons. Okay, and yeah, gold to replace the atmosphere of Nibiru. And remember, Nibiru in ancient Babylonian was um, Jupiter, right? So, just saying, there's a lot to this as far as astro theologically, but also uh, remember that each one of those planets, and we'll get into this, are responsible for uh, a color, a day of the week, right? There, there's seven rays as well. The Philosopher's Stone, or the White Stone by the river, the Sword and the Stone, like King Arthur, um, the Emerald Tablets are all the same, metaphors which contain the knowledge of creation, a symbol that represents the final outcome of man's inner transformation, of the conversion of the base metal of his outer character to the golden properties of the higher self through the alchemy of time and consciousness. Essentially, you know, becoming golden, man, right? Ascension. Right? Ascension. It's awakening. Um, now, I want to start over here in the Key of Solomon. And this is how to render thyself a master of a treasure possessed by spirits. Okay? <laughs> and this is a crazy fucking book. Um, the Key of Solomon if you ever, and there's greater keys and lesser keys, which are higher and lower. So uh, we know that, you know, lower is more about carnal, you know, things. And higher is more of a higher spiritual, you know, principle. Now the earth being inhabited, as I have before said unto thee, by a great number of celestial beings and spirits, who by their subtlety and prevision, Know the places wherein treasures are hidden. And seeing that it often happeneth that those men who undertake a search for these said treasures are molested and sometimes put to death by the aforesaid spirits, which are called gnomes, which, however, is not done through the avarice of these said gnomes, a spirit being incapable of possessing anything, having no material senses wherewith to bring it into use. But because the spirits, who are enemies of the passions, are equally so of avarice unto which men are so much inclined, and foreseeing the evil ends for which the treasures will be employed, have some interest and aim in maintaining the earth in its condition of price and value. 
seeing that they are its inhabitants, and when they slightly disturb the workers in such kind of treasures, it is a warning which they give to them to cease from the work, and if it happen that greedy importunity of the aforesaid workers oblige them to continue, notwithstanding the aforesaid warnings, the spirits, irritated by their despising the same, frequently put the workmen to death. But know, O oh my son, that from the time that thou shalt have the good fortune to be familiar with such kinds of spirits, that thou shalt be able, by means of what I've taught thee, to make them submit unto thine orders. They will be happy to give thee, and to make thee partaker in that which they uselessly possess, provided that thine object and end shall be to make good use thereof. So he's saying they're going to be happy to release the riches, the treasures to you, provided that, um, you know, the end justifies the means. You make good use of what you receive from the spirits. Now, on a Sunday before sunrise, between the 10th of July and the 20th of August, when the moon is in the sign of the lion, thou shalt go into the place where thou shalt either by interrogation of intelligence or otherwise that there is a treasure. There shalt describe a circle of sufficient size with the sword of magical art wherein to open the earth. As the nature of the ground will allow, thrice during the day shalt thou scent it with the incense proper for the day. After which, being clothed in the raiment proper for the operation, thou shalt suspend in some way by a machine immediately above the opening a lamp, whose oil should be mingled with the fat of a man who has died in the month of July. This is showing you how to actually do it, right? How to bring this in. Then it gives you the prayer here, okay? Adonai Elohim El Elhe Asher Elhe, Prince of Princes, existence of existences, have mercy upon me, and cast thine eyes upon thine servant, who invokes thee most devoutly, and supplicates thee by thy holy and tremendous name, Tetragrammaton, to be propitious. And remember when we were talking about the ten utterances of Kabbalah, right? Tetragram, tetragrammaton uh, is the name of God, right? Godhead, Bodhead, right? And to order thine angels and spirits to come and to take up their abode in this place, O ye angels and spirits of the stars, O all ye angels and elementary spirits, O all ye spirits present before the face of God, I minister and faithful servants of the Most High, conjure ye. Let God himself the existence of existences conjure ye to come and be present at this operation. I, the servant of God, most humbly entreat ye. Amen. Having then caused the workmen to fill in the hole, thou shalt license the spirits to depart, thanking them for the favor they've shown unto thee, and saying, and then it goes on on how you, you know, get rid of the spirits after they have been used. We're going to look at seeking favor and love here in just a second, but I want to first jump over to chapter 2, um, and this is of the days and the hours and the virtues of the planet. So, like, whenever you'll notice, um, a lot of channels that do gematria will show you that there's a numeral, numerical pattern and things that take place, you'll see certain people that are aligned with, say, the Jesuits. Um, they'll have on three in the skull and bones on three twenty-two and nine eleven, um, and using the numbers thirty-three and six 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 six, right, or forty, right. These these numbers will be synonymous with these groups because they're invoking a certain type of energy. You'll also see that certain things happen and take place on the same days of the week or on numbers correlating to hours of a specific deity. So every hour of the day, every day of the week, every color of the rainbow, every shape, right, 
has a correlation to a deity or an energy and that's what makes up the algorithms of of the spellcraft that we see done on the masses through certain headlines you'll look at the headlines one day and all the headlines will have similar gematria codes pointing to one or two things which are usually of you know dark origin or or foreshadowing um, big events that are coming up whether they're false flag or crisis events or major sacrifices or rituals that are being performed in public. They're foreshadowed before they ever happen. And then there's a lot of things that are synonymous with that that's being pushed into the subconsciousness of all the people collectively through propaganda um, and consumerism and all of this to kind of amplify the effect it has on us. So we're ultimately walking around being bombarded with symbolism all day, numerology all day, right? And spellcraft all day through the words, especially it is the spelling of the word, right? The spell of the word when you understand you stand under that spell, right? So you're being oppressed by those words, you know? And we're signing legal documents through the legal side of our system that are placing curses on our land, curses on ourselves, right? Given dominion of other people or given our dominion over to other people or other ent entities, right? Which all, all governments, all um, worldly principality, power and dominion falls under the dominion of the God of this world, right? Which is the Saturn uh, or Saturnian um, dominion, right? Now, when thou wishest to make any experiment or operation, you must first prepare beforehand all the requisites which thou will find described in the following chapters, observing the days, the hours, and the other effects of the constellations which may be found in this chapter. And remember, um, astrology, divination, using pendulums, tarot, all of this, right? We talked about this. Sigils, all of it. Uh, it is therefore advisable to know that the hours of the day and of the night together are 24 in number and that each hour is governed by one of the seven planets in regular order. Remember the seven planets, these are also the seven days of the week. These are also the seven colors of the rainbow and the, the rainbow is the covenant with God. Okay, so they are the rulers of the reality, right? They're the... Um, the principalities of powers and dominions in high places. That's that's what they are, right? They're the, the governors or the archons, okay? The demiurge, if you will. Now, commencing at the highest, and, and that's why you're supposed to not worship the stars, right? Because planets are stars, they're, they're celestial beings. Now, the order of the planets is as follows. Shabbatai is Saturn. Beneath Saturn is Zedek or Jupiter. Beneath Jupiter is Marim or Mars. And beneath Mars is Shemesh, the sun. Beneath the sun is Noga or Venus. Beneath Venus is Kokov, Mercury. And beneath Mercury is Levana, the moon, which is the lowest of all the planets. Right? You see Levin in Levana. Now, it must therefore be understood that the planets have their dominion over the day which approach nearest unto the name which is given and attributed to them. Over Saturday, Saturn, Thursday, Jupiter, Tuesday, Mars, Sunday, the Sun, Friday, Venus, Wednesday, Mercury, and Monday, the Moon. The rule of the planets over each hour begins from the dawn at the rising of the Sun on the day which takes its name from the planet and the planet which follows in its order succeeds to the rule over the next hour. Thus, on Saturday, Saturn rules the first hour, Jupiter the second, Mars the third, Sun the fourth, Venus the 5th, Mars the 6th, uh, Moon the 7th, and Saturn rules over the 8th, and the other planets in their turn, right? So Jupiter B9, once again, it starts back over, okay? Now, and note that each experiment or magical operation should be performed under the planet, and usually in the hour, which refers to the same. For example, in the days and hours of Saturn, thou can perform experiments to summon the souls from Hades, but only of those who have died a natural death. Similarly, on these days and hours, you can operate to bring either good or bad fortune to buildings, to have familiar spirits attend there in sleep, to cause good or ill success to business, possessions, goods, 
seeds, fruits, and similar things in order to acquire learning, to bring destruction and to give death and to sow hatred and discord. The days and hours of Jupiter are proper for obtaining honors, acquiring riches, contracting friendships, preserving health, and arriving at all that, can, that thou can desire. In the days and hours of Mars, thou can make experiments regarding war, to arrive at military honor, to acquire courage, to overthrow enemies, to further cause ruin, slaughter, cruelty, discord, to wound and give death. The days and hours of the sun are very good for perfecting experiments regarding temporal wealth, hope, gain, fortune, divination, favor of princes, dissolve hostile feelings, and making friends. The days and hours of Venus are good for forming friendships, for kindness and love, for joyous and pleasant undertakings, and for travel. The days and hours of Mercury are good for eloquence and intelligence, promptitude in business, science and divination, wonders, apparitions, answers regarding the future. And thou can operate under this planet for theft, writing, deceit, and merchandise. The day and hour of the moon are good for embassies, voyages, envoys, messages, navigation, reconciliation, love, the acquisition of merchandise by water. Thou should take care punctually to observe all the instructions contained in this chapter if you desire to succeed seeing that the truth of magical science depend thereon. The hours of Saturn, of Mars, and of the Moon are alike. They're good for communicating and speaking with spirits, as those of Mercury are for recovering thefts by the means of spirits. The hours of Mars serve for summoning souls from Hades, especially of those slain in battle. The hours of the Sun, Jupiter, and Venus are adapted for preparing any operation whatsoever of love, kindness, and visibility, as is hereafter more fully shown, to which must be added other things of similar nature contained in our work. The hours of Saturn and Mars, and also the days on which the Moon is conjunct with them, or when she receives their opposition or quantile aspect, are excellent for making experiments of hatred, enmity, quarrel, discord, and other operations of the same kind which are given later in this work. The hours of Mercury are good for undertaking experiments relating to games, raillery, jest, sports, and the like. The hours of Sun and Jupiter and of Venus, particularly on the days they rule, are good for all extraordinary, uncommon, and unknown operations. The hours of the Moon are proper for making trial of experiments relating to recovery of stolen property, obtaining nocturnal visions or night visions, summoning spirits while in sleep, and preparing for anything relating to water. The hours of Venus are for um, poisons, all things of the nature of Venus, preparing powders, provocative of madness, and the like of things. But in order to thoroughly affect the operations of this art, you should perform them not only on the hours, but on the days of the planets as well. Because then the experiment will always succeed better. Provide that you observe the rules laid down. For if thou admits one single condition, you will never arrive at the accomplishment of the art. So it's saying, like, whatever type of spell or work you're trying to accomplish, each planet, you know, depending on what they're conjunct to, depending on their position, um, right, and what you're trying, the energy you're trying to evoke, right, is related to those particular deeds. So if you're trying to recover stolen money or get wisdom or visions, you go to Mercury, right, and it takes place, you have to do the work on that particular day that's associated with that particular planet, and then you do it on the hours of that. If it's one and eight, Right? For Saturn, you're trying to do, you know, summon something from hell or bring death on someone, right? You're going to, you're going to do the ritual at one o'clock and at eight o'clock, like clockwork on, on Saturday, right? Because it's Saturn's day and you're going to use things, um, elements, um, 
such as uh, herbs and spices and things that correlate to Saturn, um, different elements like iron and things like that that correlate to Saturn. Uh, and you might take ritual baths with sulfur in it. I mean, like just depending on like what you're doing, what you're trying to evoke. We talked about, you know, because it's always about the power of life and death when it comes to witchcraft and magic, right? That's why sex and sacrifice are the two most powerful forms of magic. Sex magic, because it has that power of life, right? Masculine, feminine, the two genders coming together with rhythm, you know, vibration, correspondence, blur, the whole thing, it's working. It's the power of creation right there, right? And then death being the sacrifice or to take life, right? The release, you know? So, um, and, and see, embrace and release, right? Of energy. You know, we're, we're constantly, we're constantly interacting with the energies around us, the environment around us. It's up to us on how we choose to uh, work with said energies. You know, we can make ourselves a magnet for nothing but positive, loving, good energy that can be used and channeled in our lives in a multitude of areas and directions that that creates this tremendous balance in our life too. I feel like you don't want to become one dimensional in anything and that's why I'm trying to go through all of the different ways of creating magic. I know people are going to be like um, that they're not going to like it because they have this stigma with, with witchcraft and the occult and they believe it's all evil but it's ultimately always up to the person you know the person that's um, you know doing the practice it's up to them you know if you're of good character and you're doing everything sowing good seeds and right? doing things from the right place um, then you're gonna get good results you know, it's the people that bend and twist it and try to take advantage of other people and steal from other people and harm other people. There's karma that comes back with that, you know. And that's what we're trying to learn is so we can protect ourselves from walking face first into the traps that are set up throughout the entirety of the system, right? Everything, they give you a, a slave name, right? As soon as you're born and put you into bondage with a social security number, do you honestly think that there's not a spiritual principle to all of these things? Every science that we have comes from the sacred sciences, right? Everything that you see on the, from the dollar bill, there's spiritual, you know, the new world order and shit is written on the dollar bill and stuff. It's like letting you know. Right? In God we trust. Right? There is this spiritual element to, to, to the entirety of our world and our planet. It's like, it's now, it's, it's a, the age where now we're going to be coming into more of an awareness and more of a connectedness, I think, spiritually, is upon us. Because we went really, you know, we've really tapped out and, and, and dumbed down and numbed out away from the spirit for, for a long time, you know. It's like, it's almost, there's so many, a lot of people don't even believe we have a soul, right? To believe any of this is possible, but, you know, it's proven time and time again that those who are able to control their thoughts, right, and be intentional uh, with their, their thinking and with their energy and with their focus, right, are able to accomplish more and to get more done. And all the people that run the entirety of the world, they, they believe this stuff whether you believe it or not. So, moving forward. Now, <clears throat> concerning the arts, if thou wish to succeed, it's necessary to make the following experiments in arts in days and hours with the requisite solemn solemnities and ceremonies contained and laid down in the following chapters. Experiments then are of two kinds. The first is to make trial of what I have said can be easily performed without a circle and in this case, it's not necessary to observe anything but what you'll find in the proper chapters. The second can in no way be brought to perfection without the circle. And in order to accomplish this perfectly, it's necessary to take notes of all the preparations which the master of the art and his disciples must undertake before constructing the circle.
Now we're going to go through this. Like this is constructing the circle and all this, all right? Now, before commencing operations, both the master and his disciples must abstain with great and thorough continence during the space of nine days from sensual pleasures, from vain and from foolish conversation, as plainly appeared in the second book, chapter 4, six of these nine days having expired, you must recite frequently the prayer and confession as will be told. On the seventh day, the master being alone, let him enter into a secret place and let him take off his clothes and bathe himself from head to foot in consecrated and exercised water, saying devoutly and humbly the prayer of Lord Ad Adonai, etc., as written in the second book, chapter 2. The prayer being finished, let the master quit the water and put upon his flesh raiment of white linen, clean and unsoiled, and let him go with his disciples unto a secret place and command them to strip themselves naked. And they having taken off their clothes, let them exercise water and pour it upon their heads so that it flows down to their feet and bathes them completely. Now pouring this water on them, let the master say, Be ye regenerate, renewed, washed, and pure, etc. As in book 2, chapter 3. Which being done, the disciples must clothe themselves, putting upon their flesh, like their master, raiment of white linen, clean, unsoiled. And the three last days, the master and his disciples should fast, observing the solemnities and prayers marked in book 2. To chapter 2. So you see, they start off with the cleansing ritual, right, which is baptism. You know, they're taking water and they're dumping it over themselves and they're saying a prayer to Adonai. You know, just saying. Now, uh, and then putting on white linen. Now note that the last two days should be calm weather, without wind, without clouds, rushing hither and thither over the, over the face of the sky. On the last day, let the master go with his disciples unto a secret fountain of running water, or unto a flowing stream, and let there each of them, taking off his clothes, wash himself with due solemnity, and rehearse in book two, when they are clean and pure, let each put on his garments of white linen, pure and clean, using the prayers of the ceremonies in book two, and let which the master alone say the confession. That when being finished, the master signs of penitence, will kiss the disciples on the forehead, and each of them will kiss the other. Afterwards, let the master extend his hands over the disciples in a sign of absolution and bless them, which being done, will distribute to each of his disciples the instrument necessary for magical art, which he has to carry into the circle. So he's like doing the whole absolution thing like a priest. Now, we're going to go down to the construction of the circle. Take thou the knife, the sickle, or the sword of magical art, consecrated after a manner, in order which we shall deliver unto thee. With this knife, or with this sickle of art, thou shalt describe beyond the inner circle, what thou shalt have already formed, a second circle encompassing the other at a distance of one foot, therefrom having the same center. Within the space of a foot, in breadth, between the first and second circumferal line, thou shalt trace towards the four quarters of the earth the sacred and venerable symbols of the holy letter Tau. And between the first and the second circle, which thou shalt thyself have drawn the instrument of magical art, should make four hexagonal pentacles. Right? And between these shall write four terrible and tremendous names of God. Right? Yad, Yad, Hey, Bad, Hey, right? The four names of God. This is Tetragrammaton, right? You see it right there. Between the east and the south, supreme name. See? Tetragrammaton. Between the south and west, the essential, Ahai. Between the west and north, Empower, Elion. Between the north and east, the great name, Eloah. And the names of supreme importance in the list of the Sephiroth and their so sovereign equivalents. Remember in the Sephiroth we were talking about um, you know the ten utterances too right from the Kabbalah. Thou must write these four names of the Most Holy One in this order. At the east El 
at the west, Yah, at the south, Agla, and at the north, Adonai. Between the two squares, the name Tetragrammaton is to be written the same way as shown in the plate. While constructing the circle, the master should recite the following psalms. Psalm 2, and it just goes on, telling you the different psalms. Which, matter of fact, I'm going to take this link, and I'm going to drop this in the chat, just in case uh, one of you guys want to check this out for yourself. Okay? I want to put this out there for people that want to go look this up themselves. You can do it after the video or whatever. But, um, I'm trying to tell you, like, there's so much power in this. This is so ancient. <laughs> this is so ancient, right? It's telling you from the right way to how to draw the circle and what to put inside of it to we're going to go into deeper things, but we've told you now how you write out sentences, cross out all of the letters that are doubles, right? And see what you come up with next and take all those letters, put them together, make a sigil out of it. Put them together, make a new word out of it. That way you can repeat it in utterance, a phrase, Right, like all of these things, and even to you know, servitors where you draw something and you picture it growing in your head over the cycle of a moon about 28 days, you know, from new moon to new moon or full moon to full moon, whatever. Right, like there's a million different ways that you can create something without ever sacrificing blood or you know, participating in, in sex magic if you don't want to. You know, it's like, uh, but I feel like. If we educate people on all the different ways to perform magic, right? Magical acts, simple rituals in your life that you can apply towards your growth, love and relationships, your career, you know, and your finances, you know, the protection and strength and unity of your family, the peace in your world, your own health. You know, strong mind, strong will, like these are, you know, to be emotionally sound. And it's like doing the work too. You got to do the work, you know. And it's like doing that will give you such a disciplined approach to every aspect of your life. It's like you finally are in the driver's seat. Self-mastery, and that's what a magician is, is a self-master. It's someone who's mastered themselves, Right. Because you can't even begin to, to start to try to control the outer elements until you've learned to master the inside of you. You know, and you can never truly tame a spirit. And I don't think it's about trying to tame your spirit. I think it's about fanning the flames of your spirit. Right? Feeding them with the right things. Positive things. Good things. Holy things. Righteous things. You know? And creating a karmic imbalance by doing good. You know? Don't put yourself in a, the system of debt that the world has created. That's a, that's a Luciferian system. And it's like, I hate to say it. It's like the world is on this system of, of constant karmic debt. They're constantly paying it back. That's, you know. And it's like they'll never dig themselves out of that hole. But it's about, you know, being even. <laughs> With, with with spirit and not owing a debt. Instead, creating good positive karma so you have good positive coming back to you. You're owed good things, you know? And then being very intentional about how you use your energy in the directions that you choose to focus on in life. The things, the people you choose to focus on in life. And only allow yourself to be to give energy to things that give back to you and that are compatible with you, right? And that are in alignment with your purpose and where you're trying to go and to make sure that the ends do justify the means, you know? And not in a nefarious way, but in a respectful, principled, disciplined way, right? And that's what a true disciple is, right? Disciples of Christ are, are disciplines of the anointing. That's what a disciple of Christ is. It's discipline of the anointing. Right? It's understanding that, that that dragon, that serpent that exists within all of us, right? And that when it uncoils and activates, right? And we take that ride, we take that journey, that it's an expression of ourself that's been activated. 
the true essence or nature of ourself, that smokeless fire, that spark. Thor has struck the hammer, you know, and we are recreating ourselves. We're tapping into the higher aspect of ourself because we're now, we're now able to fundamentally create the lower aspect, the mirror image to the and mold it and shape it to the to the truer reflection of self, right? And not not thrive off of ego alone, becoming an energy vampire. You know, always feeding off of the world, never giving nothing to the world, being a consumer, you know, but instead we become co-creators and producers, you know, and everything we touch, we give life to and we, we understand the power of life and death, the, the balance of the masculine and the feminine, the left and the right hand path, you know, and understanding that you know, no, we're not God, but in essence, we are all a piece of God, which makes us the children of God, right? And it's about having a humility in that and still being able to be centered, you know, in yourself and in the world, no matter what's going on around you, to be indifferent to it if you need to be, to be able to, to detach from whatever you need to detach from, but at the same time, always remain connected to the lifeblood, the soul of humanity. It's a really delicate tightrope that we have to walk, but it's like there's so many different practices and disciplines and you know ways of looking at it, schools of thought that that have been so and it's been so suppressed from us for such a long time. But it's like now it's like we're coming to these understandings on our own, you know. And it's like it's this is the age I feel like when we're all ready for this knowledge and this information and that's why you see such a shift now such an awakening now and we have to understand that there is a false awakening taking place at the same time where people are trying to to socially engineer or navigate this this awakening of consciousness and humanity and take it to a darker place that has us all controlled and under the you know oppression of artificial intelligence and in governments and you know a lack of our own agency at the end of the day. And it's like we have to push for more natural things um, and for true independence, but at the same time, you know, uh, genuine connectedness with, with the all and with the whole, not just virtually or technologically connected, but spiritually, emotionally connected, right? And being part of the human family, the human experience. Now, When looking at this, and I, and I brought out this book before. This is a this is a deep one. Um, we'll we'll read the, the the first chapter, but this is the Grand Grimoire, okay. And this is supposed to be come from King Solomon as well. I just want to show you something, All right? These are this has making covenants and everything. Warning, right? This is response and covenants with spirits. This just shows you the... There it is. The names and offices of the spirits, right? In hell and the underworld. And what names to call them by. And how you go about dealing with each one of them and their ranking. And making a covenant or agreement with them, a deal with them, and which type of demon you would need to make a deal with for what, what you want. Do you want, you know, sex and pleasure? Do you want riches, wealth, fame? Like, what do you want? Because depending on that, depends on the demon, just like what we were talking about with the days of the week and, and the numbers. So the names and officers of the spirits, Lucifer being the emperor, right? Beelzebuth. The Prince, Astaroth, Grand Duke. Then come the superior spirits who are beneath the three mentioned above. Lucifuge, Prime Minister, that's Lucifuge, Rethokal. Sentinachia, see the Satan in there, uh, Great General. Aglarep, General, Flerti, Lieutenant General, Stargenatus, Dergetanus. Brigadier and Nibiros, Camp Marshall. The first seven superior spirits that I will name direct their power over all the internal powers and have at their service 18 other spirits that are beneath them. And that is Baal being number one, 
Agoris, Marbus, Prusilus, Amon, Barbatos, Bur, Gusoin, Botus, Batim, Herson, Eligor, Lore, Valafor, Fare, Aperos, Nebiros, and Glossi Bodolus, or Bolus, Glossi Bolus. And see dates packed, right? This is a pact. Signs and characters of the spirit. And this is that same principle, right? It's like the servitor image right there, right? Of the um, deity or the demon, his name written out. And then right here, taking the letters or uh, pieces of the letters and then making a sigil out of it. Right? See, they wrote stuff here, right? They're writing of some sort. These are letters, and they put them together, and they make symbols and characters out of them. This is how you create sigils. We talked about this in yesterday's video. And you can see for each one, Lucifer, Beelzebuth, Astaroth, Lucifuge, Riffle, is basically the same guy as Lucifer. Uh, Satanachia, Aglarep, Flirty, Sargatanus, Nibiros. After having indicated the above names of the 18 spirits who are inferior to the first six, it's necessary to understand the following. Lucifuge commands the first three, who are called Baal, Agabus, and Marbus, Setantia over Prusilus, Amon, and Barbatos, Aglirep over Bur, Susan, and Betis, Thuredi over Batim, Hussan, Eligor, Sargatanus over Lare, Valafor, and Fare, and Nibiros over Epiros, and Nibiros, and Glociabolus. Although there are millions of spirits that are inferior to those above, it would be useless to describe them because they are employed by the superior ones. To work in their place, all of these inferior spirits are employed as if they were workers of slaves. Now then, in making pact with one of the first principal spirits of which you will have need, it won't matter which spirit serves you. Nonetheless, always ask for the one with which you have made the pact, whether it is one of the three principal ones or one of their subjects which serve you. Now you come to know the power, science, art, and talents at all of the subject spirits, so that he who you would like to make a pact can find in each one of the six superior spirits the power that he will need. The first is the great Lucifuge Rofakau, the infernal prime minister who possesses the power that Lucifer gave him over all worldly riches and treasures. He has beneath him Baal, Agarus, and Marbus, along with thousands of other demons or spirits who are his subordinates. The second is the great Satancha, Satanacha, the great general who has the power to make all young or old. Women submit to him. He commands a strong legion of spirits and has beneath him Prusilus, Amon, and Barbatos. A Jilarep, general, who has the power to uncover the most well-hidden secrets of all the courts and cabinets of the world, and reveals the greatest mysteries. He commands a second legion of spirits and has Gur, Gusoin, and Boris, etc. under his command. Fluredi, Lieutenant General, has the power to do whatever thing one could want at night time. He makes hail fall wherever he deigns and commands a considerable body of spirits and has Batim, Hersam, and Elagor, etc. beneath him. Sargitanus Brigadier has the power to render one invisible and to transport you anywhere, to open all the keyholes to let you see what is going on in other houses, or to teach you necromancy. He commands other brigades of spirits, and who has beneath him Lore, Valafar, and Fare, etc. Nibirus, the Field Marshal, or Inspector General, has the power to do evil to whomever he pleases and enables one to find the hand of glory and teaches the qualities of minerals, vegetables of all the animals, pure and impure, and possesses the art of foretelling the future. 
being one of the best necromancers of all the infernal spirits, he can go anywhere and inspect all of the infernal militias it has beneath him a Peros, Nebirus, and Glossia Bolas. Warning. When you want to make your pact with one of the principal spirits that I have named, begin the day before the eve of the pact, cutting a branch of wild hazel that has never bloomed with a new blade that has never been used. In the same manner that I have described in the first book, precisely at that moment the sun appears on the horizon, then procure a bloodstone and two candles that have been blessed and choose a place that nobody can disturb you for the operation. You can make a pact in a room that is far from turmoil or in some hamlet of an old ruined castle so that the spirit has the power to transport the treasure where he pleases. Remember, we were talking about the demons and finding treasure in the last book, too, right? Having returned to the opportune place, draw a triangle with a bloodstone, and you only need to do this operation the first time the pact is made. Then put the two blessed candles on the sides of the triangle, as is described in the triangle of the pacts, making the saintly name of Jesus behind, so that the spirits cannot do you any harm. Following this, go to the center of the triangle with the mysterious rod and the great invocation of the spirit, the clavicle, the petition, the pact that you in mind to make with the spirit, and sending back of the spirit, as will hereby be explained. It has been explained up to this point, is executed with exactitude, and start to recite the following invocation with hope and steadfast firmness. And this is the great invocation to summon the spirit with whom one wishes the pact is hurt from the great clavicle. And this is to Lucifer, right? Lucifer. And he, under, he names all the spirits that Lucifer um, rules over, right? And using the Son of God, the power of the Son of God... He is claiming dominion over the spirit. Um, the hazel is you strike it in the fire and you can literally hear demons scream allegedly when you do this. Um, creating the circle, making the triangle with the candles and all this. And then you have to take a coin, I believe, and like bite it and throw it over your shoulder. You give the first dollar of everything you get if you do this pack for money or whatever every every month to Lucifer you know so it's like there's a giving it's creating a karmic imbalance you donate it right the, the first part of everything give it away right that's that's how a lot of these work right they have little clauses in there and if you don't and that some of them are 15 year packs some of them are 30 year packs 20 year packs right when it's up you lose your soul and, and you'll mysteriously die, basically, <laughs> you know, and, and not every pack is like this, uh, depending on what you do, but, you know, I just thought, this is a cool thing to show people, because so many people talk about celebrities, and uh, politicians, and people in power, and how they sell their soul, and I don't know if people really know how it works, you know, or how easy it can be. I and mean, like this is a basic pack, but there's there's bigger ones. And I, I didn't even show it, but see, signature and blood. Right? You write it out. Write it out. You know? Sign it in blood. Like this is the legit shit. You do it at the hours and all of that of that spirit. Just like we were talking about with the planets and the, the numbers, the hours and the you know, virtues of the planets. Same thing. Right? And all the demons that rank underneath them see 20 years for all the treasures that he will give me 20 years say what and the treasure it's him pulling up like a treasure for your life basically right so he's seeking out um a life or a lifestyle He's finding a treasure, right? Like within you. So a hidden talent or something that will make you famous or something that will get you wealthy. Like a certain pattern. He's got that. That's the treasure he finds for you, right? You don't literally take you to dig up a buried treasure, 
It's like he finds that path and lays it out for you. He might command you to write a fucking book. He might tell you to start a YouTube channel. You, you know what I mean? There could be a million things. And if you have... And what a lot of people don't understand is like what's in your heart too has a lot to do with the outcomes of these things. That's why we're talking about how you burn it or, or uh, drown it or whatever, forget it, bury it, whatever, right? Because it's almost like you can work against yourself with magic by having, thinking about it and wanting it too much. And a lot of times people will create love spells and shit to try to, you know, make something work with somebody and it'll backfire, right? And end up you know, making them hate each other or creating, you know, people cheating is just, you know, or someone will die. It's just the, the wildest shit that happens as a result of this because people are not knowing what the fuck they're doing, you know? And I hate to say it, most of the people that go around trying to harm other people with um, magic are people who don't know what the fuck they're doing. I feel like if you knew what you were doing, you would never try to harm another person with anything like this because if you understand... Um, what it will do to you as a result of doing that to others then it's like or you know what you're actually bringing upon someone um and people do it like you can pay people that that know this shit and they'll put curses on other people for you you know um it's crazy i i feel like you know it's and it's not like, and you see magic in the Greco-Roman world, the study of magic in Greco-Roman world uh, is a branch of disciplines of classic ancient history and religious studies in the post-Hellenistic world of the Greeks and Romans, the public and private rituals associated with religion accepted by historians and archaeologists were a part of everyday life. Examples of this phenomenon are found in various state and cult temples, Jewish synagogues, and early Christian cathedrals and churches. These were important hubs for the ancient peoples of the Greco-Romans that would represent a connection between the heavenly realm, the divine, and the earthly planes, the dwelling place of humanity. The context of magic has become an academic study, especially in the last 20 years. Magic is generally seen as any attempt to control the environment or the self by means that are either untested or untestable, such as charms or spells. The prototypical magicians were a class of priests uh, like the Magi of the Zoroastrianism and their reputation together with that of ancient Egypt shaped the Hermeticism and Hellenistic religion. In ancient Greece, magic was viewed negatively because it was foreign, but over time the view of magic evolved. Negative connotations, which malign magic, and positive ones in the practice of religion, medicine, and divination. The Greek mystery religion had strongly magical components, and in Egypt, a large number of the magical papyri in Greek, Coptic, and Demoptic have been uncovered. Those sources contain early instances of much of the magical lore that later became part of the Western cultural expectations about the practice of magic, especially ceremonial magic. The contain early instances of the use of the magic words said to have power to command spirits, use of wands and other ritual tools, use of magic circles to defend the magician against the spirits that he's evoking or invoking, and the use of myster mysterious schools or sigils, which are thought to be useful when evoking or invoking spirits. And we've covered all of those uh, just in the last two videos. How about that? Right? And a lot of what we have now, you know, the Bible is Greek version, the Greco-Roman is where a lot of what we have now comes from. Right, in our society. We're going to take a look at the complete Golden Dawn system of magic on initiation. Initiation is the preparation for immortality. Man is only potentially immortal. Immortality is acquired when the purely human part of him becomes allied to that spiritual essence which was never created, was never born, and shall never die. It is to affect the spiritual bond with the highest that the Golden Dawn owes all its rituals and practical magical work. Initiation means to begin, to start something new. It represents the beginning of a new life, dedicated to an entirely different set of principles from those of what Wilhelm Reich once contemptuously termed Homo Normalis. Homo Normalis. Normies. <laughs> With the enormous development of scientific pragmatism, it is conceivable 
that sometime in the near distant future, robots or computers will be invented that will, to all intents and purposes, free man from the daily drudgery of common toil. If and when that occurs, what will the average man do with his leisure time? Despite the claims of various protagonists of the free future of man, I doubt that many will turn their time and energy to the pursuit of the great work in any of its forms. Many of them will continue to hunt, fish, travel in recreation vehicles, drink beer and grow fat, watch television more and more, concentrate on spectator sports, and continue their lives on a thoroughly prosaic and mundane level. If there are any excursions into outer space with the view of setting up colonies outside the earth, I am far from certain that the same fate will not await them as it did all ventures into utopian communities. There are only a mere handful who can tolerate more than a glancing casual look at other than the superficial aspects of what life presents to them. For this handful, the Golden Dawn system presents itself as the answer to their innumerable questions. The system itself is timeless. It did not owe its origins to the formation of that particular order called the Golden Dawn in the latter part of the 19th century. The greater part of it in one form or another has existed for centuries, actually forever. Not necessarily in the open where it can be attacked by secular and ecclesiastical authorities, but undercover, secretly and safely. Those who were in need of its teachings and work would inevitably be attracted to some one or other of its members and undergo initiation. This process occurred in the past, even as it does today. When the time comes for the inner awakening, as it may be called, all sorts of synchronicities, as Jung might call them, occur which lead them inevitably into the right direction, to the Western esoteric tradition. And the same. If you're meant for the mysteries, they'll find their way to you, right? You'll be attracted to a person that teaches them or, you know, talks about them or whatever. And the doors will open for you. You know, your interest will be piqued. You know, you'll be magnetically drawn to it. You know, because it's meant for you. It's meant for meant for you to know it's like your spirit will seek and discover until it finally comes to that truth till it finally comes to what what resonates with it and fulfills it and you'll continue to dig and dig and dig right until it's overflowing you know and then you'll become a fountain of information for someone else to initiate the process within themselves right and those who are illuminated that we would call illuminati true True illumination um, are just enlightened beings that have spiritually ascended and their consciousness operates on such a high, high vibratory state, a high frequency that you have to be on a, a very similar plane consciously to, to truly communicate with these people. You know, and they communicate right, plain sight, right, right in front of you. And you wouldn't know that they were communicating subconsciously unless you have the ability to raise your frequency to that place and be able to perceive it from, from, from such a high, high state as they are, right? It allows you to see the, the whole forest, right? You can't see the forest for the trees. Well, guess what? You can see the entire forest when you're at a high state of consciousness. It gives you a bird's eye view of a conscious position as a human being, right? So it allows you to communicate on that level of shared consciousness with everybody. It's part of like the hive mind. You're tapped into that, tuned into that. You're aware of that and you're, you're aware of the id, the I, right? You finally are tuned into that and that starts to take uh, control or the driver's seat over ego, right? And ego becomes so, so obvious at a certain point, you know? Um, and it's like we see that it's just, you know, a mask or an illusion that we tell ourselves is us. You know, part of the persona, the projection. What we're trying to project and we work on that projection and perfect that projection to project something more beautiful, a, a, a better mask, a better prism to filter our light through, right, into this world. 
you know, and we're more and more genuine um, as we grow, as we learn and become more comfortable in our own skin, and more connected we become as well. And the more connected, the more in tune we become, the higher the vibe goes. And eventually, it's like a ripple, you know, in, in a pond. You know, the rocks dropped in and the waves go. And it's like everybody eventually is hit by those waves. At the outer edges, it's a little, you know, less. But those that are closest to it, you know, they get hit by big waves. And then they make waves off of them, you know. And it's like we're all moving and it goes through these cycles or orbits of time, right? As the celestial spheres are orbiting around us, sending different energetic frequencies constantly to create the algorithms uh, of each one of us, the master identities that are conceived as part of this collective consciousness that we call God, right? And it's God kind of aware in its own awareness of itself. That's humanity, you know? And we're on all layers existing simultaneously. You know, there is no time, it's just experience, you know. And we've been given an amazing gift, we really have, to even be able to understand these things. And I feel like, I wish more and more people could be more intentional about, the, you know, the way that they look at the world or the way that they see things. Well, thank you. I'm glad you love hearing me talk because I feel like I talk a lot, you know, but it's, um, anyways, we'll go to evocation. This is our Libra Null. Hopefully this video went too long so far. Evocation is the art of dealing with magical beings or entities by various acts which create or contact them and allow one to conjure and command them with packs and exorcisms. And in case you can't tell, the theme of, of today is all about the numbers, days, and virtues of the planets. Right? Remember, the planets are the governors. Right? Archons. The Demiurge. Right? And the evocation of demons or entities and how to conjure them and command them. So that's what all today has been a lot about. Right, and we're going to show you, we're still going to get to the numerology. I'm going to show you how to calculate your personal year before this one's over. And the last one we got into sigils and all of that. Check out the first one, it's really good. These beings have, have a legion of names drawn from the demonology of many cultures. Elementals, familiars, incubi, succubi, budwills, demons, automata, atavisms, race, spirits, and so on. Entities may be bound to talismans, places, animals, objects, persons, incense smoke, or be mobile in the ether. It is not the case that such entities are limited to obsessions and complexes in the human mind. Although such beings customarily have their origin in the mind, they may be butted off and attached to objects and places in the form of ghosts, spirits, or vibrations, or may exert action at a distance in the form of fetishes, familiars, or poltergeists. Now, um, like a servitor. We talked about this a little bit last time. A servitor uh, is something you'll draw an image of it, right? And then you'll start on the, a new moon, uh, according to what you want to do at the planets, right? The days and the hours, you pray on those two hours for that planet on that day, and you offer um, uh, herbs and things like that and incense that correlate to whatever you're trying to create, say it's for money or whatever, right? And you watch it grow over a 28 day period. You'll do it every time that those days and hours pop up, like clockwork, for 28 days, from new moon to new moon. And then till you have this thing grown in your mind and it has images and pictures and all of this. And you've spoken its name, you've wrote out sentences, crossing out all of that, making sigils for it, right? And it's supposed to do your bidding. Right, and you give it attributes. You give it three abilities, and you know, in a way to disband it. Because what you're doing is you're charging it with your own soul, your own energy. And when we create totems, sigils, um, when we work with different tools with divination, such as cards, um, crystals, pendulums. All of these things, and when we create spells, we're using our life force, our own energy, 
right, to create. That's what we're using. So when you create a servitor, which is in essence a poltergeist, right? It's a, it's a fucking being made out of your energy that you command, right? That you created, you worked on, you seen it as a little ball of white light and you watch it grow into whatever you made. Say it looks like a butterfly at the end, into that big butterfly. And you literally envision it flying over to the person's house that you want to fall in love with you if you, that's what you made it for. If you made it, you know, it'll come and make them think about you or make them see you in a good light or make them attracted to you sexually, right? And then when you say that thing's name three times and snap, if that's the command you've given it, it disperses and all the energy is to return to you. But you have to put that in the writing, right? A lot of people don't know this. They don't know that what they're focusing their time, their energy into is actually taking their soul, Right? When people make music, when they make food, when they make love, poetry, everything, we're given our life force. That's how we co-create our energy, our essence. You know, and even something like a servitor where you can create this poltergeist to essentially do your bidding, right? That can, you can attach that and you can put it in a spirit jar Attach it to an object, whatever you want, right? These beings consist of a portion of Kia or Ka, remember Ka and Ba, big soul, little soul, or the life force attached to some etheric matter. The etheric matter, your matter is your body, the ether is your spirit the whole of which may or may not be attached to ordinary matter. <laughs> so it's saying it, it, it might not even be attached to anything ordinary. It could be your genuine soul. Evocation may be further defined as a summoning or creation of such partial beings to accomplish some purpose. Partial beings, you create it in your mind. You can't create a full being, you're not God. They may be used to cause change in oneself, change in others, or change in the universe. The advantage of using a semi-independent being rather than trying to affect a transformation directly by will are several. The entity will continue to fulfill its function independently of the magician until its life force dissipates, and you can create them to recharge off of the sun and the moonlight, okay? And to have them come back home and sit in a jar every night Right, you're attached to the teddy bear every night, whatever you put them on, right? And you can have them charge. You can have them feed off of other people's energy. You can have them feed off of grass, whatever it is. You just got to put it in there when you're creating it. Because when it runs out of energy, it just dissipates. And they will have, based on how you make them, they'll be sentient. So you have to give them a few skills. Being semi-sentient, it can adapt itself to a task in a way that a non-creating elemental by combining appropriate symbols to form a sigil. See that? Take in, I think it's like Saturn and Uranus. I think, and see they take the, the signs here, form a sigil from the elements. Conscious simple spell could not. During moments of the possession by certain entities, a magician may be the recipient of inspiration, abilities, and knowledge not normally accessible to him. Matter of fact, I've talked about this before, that when we look at the Egyptian pyramids and all the writing that they had on the wall, the glyphs, I feel like these glyphs were the same thing. They were invocations and spells, right? And they were building essentially creating things for the underworld, the afterlife. They were putting armor on their bodies, building their spacesuits, um, putting, you know, weapons and animals, and all this in the spirit realm around them. That way when they crossed over, they had the total package already made, right, from their life. It was their magical work. The priests and priestesses, that's what they were doing, was helping these kings and queens prepare for the, for the afterworld. Now, Entities may be drawn from three sources, those which are discovered clairvoyantly, those whose characteristics are given in its grimoires are spirits and demons, and those which the magician may wish to create himself. So, if you think about it, 
under that principle, that guiding principle, it would mean that your life is one to learn self-mastery, work on your craft to where you can create, co-create all the things you need for the afterlife before you die, right? And then when you cross over, you have all that because of your life's work. In all cases, establishing a relationship with the spirit follows a similar process of evocation. Firstly, the attributes of the entity. Its type, scope, name, appearance, and characteristics must be placed in the mind or, or made known to the mind. You can write them down too. Automatic drawing or writing, where a stylus is allowed to move under inspiration across the surface, may help to uncover the nature of a clairvoyantly discovered being. So Ouija boards, anything like that. May help to uncover the nature of a clairvoyantly discovered being. In the case of a created being, the following procedure is used. The magician assembles the ingredients of a composite sigil of the being's desired attributes. For example, to create an elemental to assist him with divination, the appropriate symbol might be chosen and made into a sigil such as the one shown in figure 4. Was this 4? I don't know if this is figure 4 or not. Yeah, that's figure 4. So they took two elements, right? A name and an image, and if desired, a characteristic number can also be selected for the elemental. Secondly, the will and perception are focused as intently as possible by some Gnostic method on the elemental sigils or characteristics so that these can take on a portion of the magician's life force and begin autonomous existence. In the case of pre-existing beings, this operation serves to bind the entity to the magician's will. This is customarily followed by some form of self-vanishing or even exorcism to restore the magician's consciousness to normal before he goes forth. An entity of a low order with little more than a singular An entity of a low order with little more than a singular task to perform can be left to fulfill its destiny with no further interference from its master. If at any time it's necessary to terminate it, its sigil or material basis should be destroyed and its mental image destroyed or reabsorbed by visualization. For more powerful and independent beings, a conjuration and exorcism must be in proportion to the power of the ritual which originally evoked them. To control such beings, the magicians may have to re-enter the Gnostic state to the same depth as before in order to draw their power. Any of the techniques of the Gnosis can, in theory, be used in invocation. An analysis of some of the more common methods follows. Thurgic ritual depends solely on visualizing and concentration on complex ceremonial to achieve focus on ceremonies, complex ceremonies. So it's all about the visual and concentration, right? And we talked about astral projection in the last one as well. However, the effect, and you know, you can uh, focus on a flame, right? Fire to help with that. Um, or like I said, go completely still, shut your eyes, right? And allow the dream state to kick in while awake effectively astral projecting. However, the effect of increasing the complexity is often to create more distraction rather than draw attention to the matter at hand. Will becomes multiple and the result is often disappointing. Conjuration by prayer, supplication, or command is rarely effective unless the appeal be desperate or prolonged till exhaustion ensues. And so by command and prayer, um, when you have sex, the air is charged, and that's when command works really well, right? When the air is charged after a death or after sex, right? Highly emotion charges the air, um, right? The authority of the words, exhausting and repetition, okay? This type of ritual can be improved by the use of poetic exaltation, chanting, ecstatic dancing, and drumming. So drums chants, right, um, poetry, all of that, exalting the, the being. The Goetic tradition of the grimoires uses an additional technique, terror. The grimoires were compiled by Catholic priests and much of what they wrote was deliberate abomination in their own terms. 
Transport the whole right to a graveyard or crypt at midnight, and one has compounded a powerful mechanism for concentrating the Kia by paralyzing the peripheral functions of the mind by fear. If the magician can maintain control under these conditions, his will is singular and mighty. So, if you can go in those conditions, right, and keep your shit cool, keep it together, stay even, then you are, in essence, you know, you're in control. The Ophidian tradition uses sexual orgasm to focus the will and perception. It's interesting to note that poltergeist activity invariably centers around the sexually disturbed, usually children at puberty or, more rarely, women at menopause. During these periods of acute tension, uh, intense excitation can channel the mind and allow the life force to manifest frustration outside of the body by hurling objects around. To perform evocation by the Ophidian method, the attributes of an incidentalized in form are concentrated on at orgasm and may be afterward anointed with sex fluids. The process is rather like the deliberate creation of an obsession. If enough power can be put into it, it will be capable of independent existence. Incubi and succubi are pre-existing entities, so be careful, right? Using sexual fluids and stuff. <laughs> um, incubi and succubi are pre-existing entities created by other people's pathological sexuality. Incubi traditionally um, seek sexual intercourse with living females and succubi with males often in sleep. However, both forms are almost invariably male. The succubi may make some slight attempt to disguise themselves as females. Unfortunately, they're both predatory and stupid, with little power or motivation for anything but sex. Sacrifice has been used in the past to create fear or terror, or to invoke the gnosis of pain and support of goetic-type evocations. However, this method, method easily exhausts itself, and the sorcerer may end up wading in oceans of blood, much as the Aztecs did, for very little result. <clears throat> blood sacrificed is most effective and most easily controlled by the use of one's own blood, which is customarily allowed to fall upon the sigil or talisman of the demon. However, the power to control blood sacrifice usually brings with it the wisdom to avoid it in favor of other methods. See, the power to control blood sacrifice usually brings with it the wisdom to avoid it in favor of using other methods. So, conjuration to visible appearances to prove to oneself or others. The objective reality of spirits is an ill-considered act. The conditions necessary for its appearance will always allow the pretension of the belief that such things are the result of hypnosis, hallucination, or delusion. Indeed, they are a hallucination, for such things do not normally have a physical appearance and have to be persuaded to assume one. Fasting, sleep, and sensory deprivation combined with drugs and clouds of incense smoke will usually provide a demon with sufficiently sensitive and malleable media in which to manifest an image if commanded to do so. The medieval idea of a pact is an overdramatization, but it contains a gem of truth. All one's thoughts, obsessions, and demons must be reabsorbed before Kia can become one with chaos. However useful such things may be to him in the short term, the sorcerer must eventually recant. Invocation the ultimate invocation, that of Kia, cannot be performed. The paradox is that as Kia has no dualized qualities, there are no attributes by which to invoke it. To give it one quality is merely to deny it another. As an observant dualistic being once said, I am that, I am not. Nevertheless, a magician may need to make some rearrangements or additions to what he is. Metamorphosis may be pursued by seeking that which one is not and transcending both in mutual annihilation. Alternatively, the process of invocation may be seen as an adding to the magician's psyche any elements which are missing. It's true that the mind must be finally surrendered as one enters fully into chaos, but a complete and balanced psychocosm is more easily surrendered. The magical process of shuffling beliefs and desires attendant upon the process of invocation also demonstrates that one's dominant obsessions or personality are quite arbitrary and hence more easily banished. 
There are many maps of the mind, most of which are inconsistent, contradictory, and based on highly fanciful theories. Many use a symbology of God forms for all mythology and bodies of psychology. A complete mythic pantheon resumes all of man's mental characteristics. Magicians will often use a pagan pantheon of gods as a basis for invoking some particular insight or ability. As these myths provide the most explicit and developed formulation of the most particular idea's extent. However, it's possible to use almost anything from the archetypes of the collective unconscious to the elemental qualities of alchemy. If the magician taps a deep enough level of power, these forms may manifest with sufficient force to convince the mind of the objective existence of God. Yet the aim of invocation is temporary possession by the God. Communication from the God. These are uh, psychocosms or mental maps. A manifestation of the God's magical powers rather than the formation of religious cults. The actual method of invocation may be described as a total immersion in the qualities pertaining to the desired form. One invokes in every conceivable way. The magician first programs himself into identity with the god by arranging all his experiences to coincide with its nature. In the most elaborate form of ritual, he may surround himself with the sounds, smells, colors, instruments, memories, numbers, symbols, music, and poetry suggestive of the god or quality. Secondly, he unites his life force to the god image which he has united his mind. This is accomplished with techniques from Gnosis. Figure 5 shows examples of maps of the mind following our suggestions of practical ritual invocation. And um, we've seen that in the, the images up there. The example, this is invoking the war god, standing in a pentagonal chamber, a pentagon, lit by five red lamps. He's robed in crimson and the skin of a great bear or wolf. He's guarded about with weapons of steel and an iron crown or helmet adorns his head. He has prepared his body by fasting, by rigors, by scourging, and by stimulants. <sighs> he has constantly turned his mind to the things of Mars during the preparations. He casts sulfur, oak, and acree resins into the thurible and anoints his body with tiger balm. He beats a martial air upon a drum to open the temple, or else fires a loud weapon into the air. He banished all foreign influences from the mind, by what means he may, a pentagram ritual being preferred, drawing blood from his right shoulder with a dagger. He traces the sigil of Mars on his breast and the eye of Horus on his brow. With a sharp sword, he draws a symbol of Mars about him in his mind's eye in lines of crimson fire and visualizes himself in the form of the god Horus. Then he begins his war dance while an assistant, if he has one, continues to beat the rhythm. Apply the scourge or discharge firearms. Wow. And then you see. <laughs> wow. Pretty crazy. Pretty crazy. I won't go through the whole thing. Liberation. Sacrilege. Destroying the sacred. sacred heresy. And anathemism. Self-destruction. Pretty crazy. The magician's most important invocation is that of his genius, Damon. True will or all jides. This operation is traditionally known as attaining the knowledge and conversation of the holy guardian angel. That's pretty insane. So invoking his genius, Damon, right? Which, uh, or all jides, which is his holy guardian angel. It's sometimes known as the magnum opus or the great work. The Algides may be defined as the most perfect vehicle of Kia on the plane of duality. As the avatar of Kia on Earth, the Algides represents the true will, the raison d'etre of the magician, his purpose in existing. The discovery of one's true will or real nature may be difficult and fraught with danger. 
since a false identification leads to obsession and madness. The operation of obtaining the knowledge and conversation is usually a lengthy one. The magician is attempting a progressive metamorphosis, a complete overhaul of his entire existence. Yet he has to seek the blueprint for his reborn self as he goes along. Life is less the meaningless accident as it seems. Kia has incarnated in these particular conditions of duality for some purpose. The inertia of previous existences propels Kia into a new form of manifestation. Each incarnation represents a task or a puzzle to be solved on the way to some greater form of completion. The key to this puzzle is in the phenomena of the plane of duality in which we find ourselves. We are, as it were, trapped in a labyrinth or maze. The only thing to do is move about and keep a close watch on the way the walls turn. In a completely chaotic universe such as this one, there are no accidents. Everything is significant. Move a single grain of sand on a distant shore and the entire future history of the world will eventually be changed. A person doing his true will is assisted by the momentum of the universe and seems possessed of amazing good luck. In beginning the great work of obtaining the knowledge in conversation, the magician vows to interpret every manifestation of existence as a direct message from the infinite chaos to himself personally. To do this is to enter the magical worldview in its totality. He takes complete responsibility for his present incarnation and must consider every experience, thing, or piece of information which assails him from any source as a reflection of the way he is conducting his existence. The idea that things happen to one that may or may not be related to the way one acts is an illusion created by our shallow awareness. Keeping a close eye on the walls of the labyrinth, the conditions of his existence, the magician may then begin his invocation. The genius is not something added to oneself, rather it is a stripping away of excess to reveal the God within. Directly on awakening, preferably at dawn, the initiate goes to the place of invocation, figuring to himself as he goes that being born anew each day brings with it the chance of greater rebirth. First, he banishes the temple of his mind by ritual or by some magical trance. Then he unveils some token or symbol or sigil which represents to him the holy guardian angel. This symbol he will likely have to change during the great work as the inspiration begins to move him. Next, he invokes an image of the angel into his mind's eye. It may be considered as a luminous duplicate of one's own form, standing in front of or behind one, or simply as a ball of brilliant light above one's head. Then he formulates his aspirations in what manner he will, humbling himself in prayer or exalting himself in loud proclamation as his need be. The best form of this invocation is spoken spontaneously from the heart and if halting at first will prove itself in time. He is aiming to establish a set of ideas and images which correspond to the nature of his genius, and at the same time receive inspiration from that source. As the magician begins to manifest more of his true will, the Augites will reveal images, names, and spiritual principles by which it can be drawn into greater manifestation. Having communicated with the invoked form, the magician should draw it into himself and go forth to live in the way he hath willed. The ritual may be concluded with an aspiration to the wisdom of silence by a brief concentration on the sigil of the Algides, but never by banishing. Periodically, more elaborate forms of ritual using more powerful forms of gnosis may be employed. Hmm. At the end of the day, there should be a counting and fresh resolution made. Though every day be a catalog of failure, there should be no sense of sin or guilt. Magic is the raising of the whole individual in perfect balance to the power of infinity, and such feelings are symptomatic of imbalance. If any unnecessary or imbalanced scraps of ego become identified with the genius by mistake, then disaster awaits. The life force flows directly into these complexes and bloats him into grotesque monsters variously known as a daemon shoranzum. 
Some magicians attempting to go too fast with this invocation have failed to banish this demon and have gone spectacularly insane as a result. Wow. And think about this. Um, musicians and their alter egos. Right? That's what this reminds me of. Invoking, you know, your guardian angel or alter ego. Right? And it driving you fucking nuts or crazy because you tried to do it too fast or you didn't do it the right way. Space-time, mass, and energy originate from chaos. They have their being in chaos and through the agency of the ether are moved by chaos into multiple forms of existence. And this is on divination. Some of the various densities of the ether have only a partial or probabilistic differentiation into existence and are somewhat intermediate in space and time, intermittent in space and time. In the same way that mass exists as a curvature in space time, extending with a gradually diminishing force from infinity we recognize as gravity, so do all events. Particularly events involving the human mind send ripples through all creation. Various methods of intercepting and interpreting these ripples constitute the mantic art of divination. These ripples through space and time can only be received if they strike a note of resonance in the receiver and are not drowned out by noise or suppressed by the psychic sensor. Some forms of resonance exist naturally as between a mother and a child or between lovers. Otherwise, they have to be established by concentrating on the object of divination. The general level of mental noise can be suppressed by silencing the mind by some Gnostic method. This also assists with concentration. The inhib inhibitory mode of the Gnosis is most frequently used. Sleeplessness, fasting, and exhaustion may cause presence through visions, but as with drugs, there is always the difficulty of maintaining concentration. Any form of magical trance can be adapted for divination by first directing an intense concentration toward the desired matter of divination, or some sigilized form of it, and then allowing impression to arrive into the vacuous state of consciousness. Many of the excitatory techniques can be used, but some with difficulty. Augury may be made by sacrifice, and men have tortured themselves for knowledge, but sex is the easiest. Erot erotocomatose lucidity, or sex trance, describes a condition brought about by continually stimulating and exhausting the sexuality by any possible means until the mind enters the borderland state between consciousness and unconsciousness. So far, only direct presence, the ideal of divination, has been discussed. It's not always possible, and recourse must often be had to the use of symbolic intermediaries. These can augment the practice of divination greatly or ruin it utterly. Assuming that the magical perception can forge some sort of tenuous connection with the answer to a question, symbols are shuffled, drawn, or selected in some manner to carry the answer into the conscious mind. And, you know, this goes into tarot and everything, you know. Whether you're using a pendulum going up and down or back and forth, right, for yes and no, or uh, the archetypes of tarot cards, it's the, the vibration that they're resonating with and the, and the placement of the card or whatever that um, brings interpretation to what's going on energetically, right? We do it with runes, uh, we do it with astrology. There's many, many, many forms of divination in many ways that, um, you know, we, we look at these things. Matter of fact, I think I think we're actually going to wrap this one up. Yeah, we've been going for a while now. We're going to wrap up part two right here. Leave it at that. Um, there will be part three. I'm gonna you know try to just keep going with these series. I hope you're liking them. I hope you're you're loving learning about all the different stuff. Um, all the different ways of magic and sorcery and just how it's used and how it works. You know, and it's like, this is what the elites use. 
this is how they do it, man. This is the deepest of the occult, and this is exposing it all, all the secrets. I mean, to me, this is priceless information, priceless knowledge, you know, and this will help you if uh, you choose to use it wisely and you choose to use it in a positive way. So I want to thank each and every one of you for watching. Please hit that like, give it a thumbs up. Let me know if you enjoyed this video. Comment. I'd love to hear your thoughts on all the stuff we talked about. Check out part one if you haven't already. Share the link. Um, share your Facebook groups, your social media. Help me to get it out there so new people can find us. Make sure to subscribe. Click all the notifications bell. They just removed my backup YouTube channel. They took it down. So donate, support to the channel. It helps me to keep this work going. Uh, you know, PayPal, Venmo, Patreon, Cash App, Facebook Messenger. I get a YouTube or Facebook subscription, or you can book a personal tarot reading, the real best damn podcast at gmail.com. Yeah, so I hope you guys enjoyed it, and I can't believe, yeah, they took down my, my backup channel. So, um, you know, show some love. Make sure to check out the uh, tarot videos, the astrology videos, and check out part one. All right, guys, remember, G Jesus is the truth, way, and life. God bless you all. I love you, and I'll see you next time. Peace. Misery up to my neck with memories I don't feel like remembering I feel like I'm not growing at all Honestly, I kind of miss the neglect Cause nowadays, everybody at my head for a check Yeah, I got addicted with the feeling of isolation If I die, spin in my grave and hopes I'm not reincarnated Cause I'm exhausted and lost in the sauce And I feel like my mind is faded Throw up my sin and throw your shade Tell me how much you hate it The ups Who do my friends hoping for tomorrow? Life ain't for the week. I feel the 